So recording is in progress. So welcome everyone. Welcome to this session of Digital Transformation in London and Lean Agile Delivery and Coaching Network. Let me say that this seems to be a very, very engaging session. Just the introduction was really, really fun. So I cannot wait to continue this session. Just uh, stealing one minute to um, introduce our next event that will be in uh, April. Um, that will be a completely different event. Actually, we have uh, a game designer that is going to introduce his game. That is a game to create games. So perfect. If you want to facilitate your sessions in some way using this uh, strategy, you, you will be able to do that. So the, the event is, is already open. So if you want to register, we will put uh, the link in the chat. Second piece of information, this event, uh, as you can imagine, is recorded and you will find the recording of this session and all the previous session of our meetups in the We Love Meetup uh, uh, channel in, on YouTube. And I see that uh, Ula already very, very precisely is putting the links in the chat. Thanks, Ula. And last piece of information is uh, the LinkedIn groups. The group, you are invited to join our LinkedIn group just to be more connected and to see what is going to happen in our community. So actually, I, I have a primary contact with Luca, but I'm not sure that he will be the leader of the session. But however, I can give the hand, the stage to Luca so he can start introducing himself and also Chris and Dan. Thank you for sharing, by the way. Uh, who, who want to start to intro the introduction? I think Dan should do a denial of service attack on the uh, on the Zoom call first. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll, I'll do it, I guess. Um, my real name is Daniel Joseph Mezik. Uh, what do I really do? I, I, I seem to be, I seem to have found my calling in causing trouble. So that seems to be the thing that I do. Um, my, uh, when my son was 10, I brought him to uh, a, a, meet a neighbor of mine when I was a kid who went on to play NHL hockey. My kid was playing hockey and we were having lunch and with this NHL guy. And the kid asked, what was my dad like? And he, as a kid, he said, oh, he was a troublemaker. So then I realized that's, that's my calling. And, and where am I? I'm, I'm coming to you from my undisclosed location in North Guilford, Connecticut, USA. So that's my introduction. And I'm sure Chris's will be much better. So let's hear what Luca or Chris have to say. Hi, my name is Luca and I, I, I collect troublesome people. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm Chris. Uh, I've, I've been doing Agile badly since about 20 years. And for the last 10 years, I've been an Agile coach and a transformation lead and all, all sorts of stuff like that. And I'm mainly drawn to Agile because it allows me to cause trouble, which is why I love Dan so much. And occasionally, as an Agile coach, I would get to have lunch with Luca, but I haven't done it for two years. I don't know why he's not been around for two years, but every time I ring him, he says, not, no pizza today. Chris, no pizza. And so, Luca, tell me, why is it for the last two years you've refused all of my advances? Sorry, uh, you've refused all of my requests for pizza. I don't know. I kind of decided to stay closed home for two years. <laughs> Uh, connected uh, to Zoom and uh, Teams, and uh, I had this crazy idea in the last two years. That's why. <laughs> well, uh, apart from that, and apart being uh, between two well-known members of the Agile community, I'm just an Agile practitioner, and I guess the reason why I'm here is that I started the uh, quite early, around 2001, 2002, to be an Agile practitioner, more around 2002. And I was lucky, that was a good time, right? No one knew about Agile, and it was mainly uh, try to find a way to be successful in uh, your own uh, job. And uh, the only way to convince team members and uh, uh, 
maybe the team, maybe the managers, maybe the organization to try some of those crazy ideas, it was to show good results. And so it was a good uh, uh, testing ground for me to learn. And since then, I never wanted or I never accepted any work that wouldn't allow me to practice lean and agile. It was so interesting and useful for me. And uh, I love that community. I love that uh, atmosphere. I love that ethos. And uh, nowadays I miss that. And that's why I'm here. And that's it from me. So I think now we start with our position. We will go around and we tell what we think about uh, these. Dan, bring forth the denial of service attack. <laughs> Release the Kraken. OK, so I have a question for you. Uh, namely, uh, is, is engagement of the people essential for any of the stuff to work or not? Uh, if people don't have to be engaged, then there's nothing further for me to talk about because my work is done here. But if people have to be engaged, then the real question is, how do we engage them? And the last time I checked, it's not by bashing them over the head with a mandate or an imposed practice, because that, pardon my French, that shit doesn't work. Uh, that dog don't hunt. Uh, none of that works. It's really good for generating transactions for the largest consulting firms and the largest organizations, uh, but it's no good for uh, actual transformation. Actual transformation requires willing people because willing people power all the improvement and unwilling people power all the impediments. That's my position on this whole thing. So the thing that really bothers me about the, uh, the agile industry as a whole is that uh, just as a thought experiment, name an incumbent thought leader, name your favorite thought leader, just silently to yourself. Just think about who's my favorite thought leader in the agile space. Who's the person I listen to the most? Who's the person who has the nicest things to say or the things that are the most useful? And then ask yourself, when's the last time that person articulated any position at all on whether imposing agile was good for uh, people's health? for their well-being, for the well-being of the industry, for the well-being of the, of the organization they're supposedly serving. You will not find a statement of position from anyone. You won't find a statement of position from any of the institutions. And the only person who's ever said anything about this is Martin Fowler. Uh, he said it in 2006, and he said it in 2018. And I put all those links in the, in the chat. You can see them. They're all there. Um, so my position is that the incumbents have presided over the worst train wreck in, uh, in, in basically in history. This thing's a total disgrace that we're not focused on engaging people. We're focused on the pushing of Agile on unwilling participants. I think it's, I think it's a total disgrace. That's my opening statement. Go on, Luca, be a grown up. Go okay. next. So, well, I, I'm shocked by that statement that will crash all the transformation market. All of it will be crashed by that statement. Okay, well, what is my position? I, I'm more practical in the sense that I look at smaller things and I, I want to share with you my experience starting from uh, uh, the certification in the Agile community, we always have a mixed feeling around certifications. In the beginning, it was an excuse for me to attend the training with the pioneers and to learn from them. Some of those trainings had certification. That was just a side effect. Then the certification market became front and central. And recently, with the scaled framework, it seems like a whole business model is around certification. Problem is, there's no uh, there's no correlation between certification and competence. Actually, the correlation is uh, uh, opposite uh, recently. Uh, my second problem with the current status of the industry has to do with scaled frameworks. They've been out there from a few years now. And uh, what's going on? Well, the, the people that are certificated on, with those frameworks, many of them, they don't want to work with the scaled framework anymore, not even the certificated trainers. Some of them 
uh, are, are publicly saying, I don't want to have nothing to do with that again. It's soul crushing. I don't want to work with the customers that uh, want to do agile transformation following those frameworks. And the same is for many agile practitioners and coaches, but it doesn't end there. Uh, good thing is I start to hear decision maker that have experienced the long and painful transformation using those frameworks. And they start to talk with each other, share information, tell the truth about how painful uh, it was. And now I start to see decision maker that look for pragmatic agile practitioner. They ask for people that is are framework agnostic. So yeah, I don't get along well with scaled framework, but it's not just framework. There are large consultancy firms that lost uh, many of their customers due to Agile, and they try to jump into the Agile market. Uh, McKinsey, to mention one, and uh, uh, they have made up a solution or they copy the Spotify model. But again, I want to mention McKinsey as the among the consultancy companies in Agile, they are one of the worst offender. They are selling <laughs> the same one size fits all shoes to everyone until you walk one mile and you feel such a pain that uh, you go and call some troublemakers to, to help you find something that works. I wanna finish quickly with uh, uh, another thing. Oh, a blooming industry of services to help professionals and consultancy firms fake agile expertise uh, and offer money uh, for uh, ask money to buy reputation. So I've been offered money to link content, uh, very low quality agile content for uh, uh, consultancy firms try to enter the agile market. I've seen, I've been told about fake agile conferences completely disconnected from the agile community where speakers have to pay basically to you buy a play, your place as a speaker so you can tell that uh, you, you will spoke at some agile consultancy firms or publication where you can pay money to be included, for example, in the list of the best 100 coaches. So this is a whole industry <laughs> fake agile expertise. And uh, those are things that uh, I've been offered uh, to pay to buy those things. So very quickly, there are also positive signs. I don't want to just be negative. I think we should amplify the positive sign, help CEO and decision maker to continue the info sharing and share with them a few tips to spot fake agile expert uh, and uh, instead identify the good one. And then for practitioners to help them burst their favorite framework bubble, enjoy the real agile community, learn across all the frameworks, all the technique and the principles. Chris, please go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to use slides because I'm a real consultant. Nice. Your, Chris, your, your slide is so beautiful that uh, I felt ashamed and I didn't use mine. There you go. Can everyone see this? Can you see my picture? It's kind of about, I think there's uh, 127 middle-aged white fat guys uh, standing around a thing there. It's a photo of that. According to the number of people I've met who actually signed that manifesto, it's got to be around there. Anyway, so anyone recognize this? This familiar to anyone? Yeah, so... I want to show you the manifesto. That is the Agile manifesto. Forget the rest of it. That is it. What it says, we're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Yeah, this, this, is a, this was meant to be a movement where we said, let's stop listening to the experts and the, the Instagram stars and the famous people who tell you how world should be. And let's go and study the people who are actually doing it and copy the stuff that works and the, the first people they copied was like ward cunningham and kent beck and ron jeffries and chet and you know brilliant but this is the manifesto it's a rejection of people making shit up sitting on their toilet with a towel wrapped around their head it's yeah you want to make some stuff up make it up that's cool but then go and prove that it works do it and then come and tell us about it and people will copy what you're doing that's the manifesto. Um, at the time they did this, they did a status update. 
they said, through this work, we have come to value. That sounds to me very much like a, at this point in time, this is what we think, which is great. And at the time, it was perfect for what was needed. But I think we're overdue a status update because I think those of us who are out there doing real agile, actually doing it rather than you know just selling certification and training, know that some of these things here, that we've got a deeper understanding of the real things that we should be doing, yeah? So we're gonna need a status update at some point. I'm not saying we need a new manifesto, just a status update. So um, hopefully some of you are familiar with this. This is the uh, crossing the chasm, the product adoption curve or the idea adoption curve, which starts with innovators on the far, let, let's see what hand is that? That's my left hand on my far left. And then after a while of innovators doing stuff, early adopters see these cool ideas the innovators have come up with, and they adopt them as well. There's then this chasm, this, this is the hard bit. This is where most good ideas die, like extreme programming. Extreme programming, I would argue, is stuck in the chasm. The people who did it to begin with, they love it and do it, but the number of people who made it across the chasm, that's more. So then once you get across the chasm, this is where the money really starts. We get the early majority, then we get the people who are like, yeah, not so much, the late majority, and then we get the people who really don't wanna do it. So let, let's put some dates on there for Agile. So, you know, the innovators were there in the year 2000, like Luca. Um, boy, that first, the noughties were fun. This, this is where it was all about fun and learning uh, dominate. So, you know, if you went to a conference in those days, you know, I remember in 2004 when we we're all taking the piss out of Ken Schwaber because he'd got a list of like the 50 people who had signed up to do the certified Scrum Master course because it was about fun. It was about learning the conferences where we were exchanging ideas and stuff. And and since then, the last dom last um, decade has really been dominated by selling stuff and certifications. That's where the dominant part of the, uh, the, com uh, the community has been. And, and I want us to look at what was going on. So in the, in the 2000, uh, you know, the leaders were completely unaware of Agile, you know, and the workers rebelled, they wrote the manifesto. Then we got towards the, the late half of the noughties and the leaders were still unaware, um, but the workers were loving Agile. This was now starting to spread. People were running projects, but, you know, we had this concept of a square peg adapter. You know, you'd run an Agile project, but you'd have a project manager who would look at, make it look like a, a waterfall project. And then we went across the chasm somewhere about 2010, all of a sudden leaders wanted some of this Agile. I think they looked at the projects that were doing really well in waterfall and suddenly discovered their own. And, and this was brilliant. This, this was the time where the leaders loved it, the workers loved it. And then we got to the late majority. And this is where the leaders still love it. They're still buying into this thing, but the workers are starting to hate it. And this is where people like Dan become relevant because the leaders are pushing hard on this stuff, but the workers don't want it. And they're not necessarily being asked whether they want to do it or not. And funnily enough, this is, this is, this is where we started to see the rise of things like modern agile and heart of agile. You know, Joshua and Al Alistair talking about these things because they were saying, yeah, we need safety. And it was like, well, in, in the noughties when we did it, you, you chose to do it. You opted in, as Dan would say. And whereas now people are being forced to do it. Um, and from a coaching perspective, you know, in the 2000s, there were no coaches. There was no agile. Uh, then we got, we had XP coaches, but we didn't really have anyone. I mean, the people that were doing it were like, what, what do you mean you need a coach to teach you how to do scrum? Are you that dumb? You know, um, so we didn't really have any coaches. There were just XP coaches. And then after 2010, we had the golden age of agile coaches. This is where people wanted to learn to do agile. This is where leaders wanted people to do agile. I loved it then. It was so good. You'd walk into a building and people actually wanted you there. Um, as opposed to as we're getting towards the end of the, the, the tens. Um, and, you know, agile coaching is being imposed. People aren't getting the choice. And once again, this is where Dan stuff becomes important. Um, and, th and then we kind of get to where we are now. Um, and this is where the workers hate. So the companies that are now adapting agile, I think the workers hate agile. That's why they're hidden in companies that are not doing it because all the other companies are doing agile now. If they want to do it. The leaders hate agile. And everyone hates the agile coaches. And, and, and this is what Dan was saying, but you know, agile is being imposed on both the leaders and the workers by the market. The market's saying, are you doing agile? And if you're not, they're getting rid of the CEO, putting a new CEO. And then we've got a 
trusted consultancies with their super duper frameworks where occasionally they'll even remember to change the name of the company on the slide deck. So status update. If you remember, we needed to do a status update. Now everyone is miserable. Yeah, certainly in that agile community. And, uh, and, and, and that's it. And I'm kind of really just putting this in as a, as a kind of a timeline that personally, I'd love to get back to that place where we'd, we're doing fun and learning. Yeah. And that we can drop the selling and, you know, the, the, the keynotes are people who have actually done the stuff they're talking about rather than keynotes by people who've never done the stuff that they're talking about on the stage. And I will end there on that positive note that everybody is miserable. Well, okay. Thank you, Luca. Thank yeah, you. Chris. Yeah. The reason, the reason why everyone's miserable is because of the uh, tragedy of the commons. So, you know, I want to kind of show you that this is what's going on. Everybody knows what this means, right? It means you have a common resource and it gets uh, plundered by people who overconsume it, right? What you've got is uh, in the agile space, basically, is a place for people to engage in, in absolutely epic levels of shameless self-promotion, okay? So there is no one group of people who's going to reform anything at all in my opinion, um, the incumbents abdicated on their watch during their stewardship, it all went to pieces. It became a, a complete dumpster fire of transactions over transformations. That's what actually happened. So, you know, if you want to find a statement from the Scrum Alliance, for example, on where they stand on the issue of forcing Agile on people, Go up to their website and good luck finding something. They haven't written anything. They haven't published anything at all. Same thing with uh, any of the so-called institutions. Go look for this statement of like where they stand on forcing Agile on people. They have nothing to say. I, Dan, I think you're being harsh on the Scrum Alliance. I think that they've done nowhere near as much harm as the Agile Alliance, where the only thing they've been promoting is the word agile and well, actually any of the yeah. principles values associated yeah. have been dumped at the door. Yeah. Stop, stop right there. Cause I want to ask a question now, another challenge question. Yeah. If we go to the learning objectives of any of the agile leadership classes, where can we find this topic of imposing practices on people? Where can we find the topic of mandates and force? Right. And, and, and the harm and folly of that. Here's the answer. Here's how many words are in the learning objectives of these of these uh, classes. Ready? None. Zero. Now, there's really great teachers out there. Like one of them is here right now, Jeff Stewart. Right. He teaches the Agile Leadership class and he teaches it uh, this, from the learning objectives. But the reality is that whatever he does to teach about imposition, in opt-in participation, in mandate, in choice, in, in human beings, in volunteerism, right? Um, that's called a local optimization because Jeff's, Jeff's stuff hasn't made it into the learning objectives. See the problem? Just, just to correct, I don't teach the Agile leadership classes because I've chosen not to, ah. given, given the state of the learning objectives. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Yeah. So thank you, Jeff, for, for uh, bringing up that point. But here's the point, I'm, and I want to add to that. Here's the point I'm making. No matter how well-meaning a teacher is, they're only doing a local optimization if it's not in the learning objectives, okay? So if the institutions really cared at all about improving the, the state of the world, you'd see something about human agency in the learning objectives. That's, that's, that's my statement. So. I'm going to move away from like, you know, um, what we might call uh, a complete renunciation of the status quo. And, and of course, in my world, you can't just criticize things without offering a superior idea. So this is going to go around again with Luca and Chris and I. When I talk again, I'm going to offer some, some thoughts about what you can actually do about it that might make your world and the world around you a little bit better. Okay, so there you go. I, I was thinking to bring uh, uh, to bring in the picture some of the questions and uh, let's do some round with some of the questions and then maybe we can we can come back to to that 
I like that, the idea of uh, what we can do about it. And uh, let's see if I manage to share or if I need, uh, no, I need help from uh, uh, Chris or Dan, or if you can share the questions, the screen with the question is something that you can do. Um, I don't think so I can. I can see the chat. Is that what we, is that where the questions are in the chat? Or? No, it's just yeah, linked. No, Sorry, Luca, why you cannot share your screen? That's not the question you can ask without embarrassing me. <laughs> try to share. Give me one second. The link is on the chat. Yeah, yeah. So somebody who, someone who sees the questions, yeah. I can, I can start to read the first question. Meanwhile, are the fake agile consultancy simply given what the market wanted? Yeah, totally, 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 yes. In fact, we could think of the deplorable state of the agile industry as an evolution where what one, one thing that's happening is the best top talent in the companies that are doing like really pathetic agile, these people are leaving and going to progressive companies. They're the first people to leave. They lord it by the exits with their resume. We know they're the top talent because they have options and they exercised. That's how you know they're top talent. They can go to other places. Isn't that fair? Is that a fair assessment? The quicker you can hop somewhere else, the bigger the bigger your your CVs, you know, the impression of your CV, right? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So top talent are the first people to leave a crappy agile setup. Where do they go? They go directly to the competitor who's interested in their resume in the same industry, and they go and enliven and embolden and uh, energize that company at the expense of the source company that did the crappy forced, forced march, death march, mandated, imposed, agile nonsense with an army of consultants. Okay, so maybe the evolutionary thing is that the best people are finding their way to the best companies and this crappy agile train wreck is what's making it all happen. I, I, I think that's over optimistic. Um, because I don't think they are going to the best companies because I don't think there are any. If you go to another company in the same business domain, you end up in another shitty company generally because most large companies are pretty shitty. Um, but, but I think what we've seen, so for example, in finance, what's happened with finance is uh, every, everyone was like, oh, well, we won't have startups in finance because you know startups are people 18 year old sitting in their bedroom and doing stuff. Actually, the fintech industry is not, 18 year olds it's it's actually people from finance who are good at what they're doing who are setting up their own companies to solve the problems for customers that they've been dying to solve for years in their companies so that they're leaving the big financial companies to go to the to the fintechs rather than competitors or so they are going to the competitors they're just not perceived as competitors they're becoming the competitors they are becoming the competitors but yeah. the, the the big companies don't necessarily perceive them as competitors because they're still small at the moment um but yeah they're not necessarily going direct they're actually kind of going to the innovative parts of the same industry rather than going to other competitors in the same industry i would argue but but to come back to the question, which is, um, you know, are people getting what they want? And I think the answer is yes. I think the people who are actually buying these consultancies are getting exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. And I've been writing a series of blog posts on something I call failureship, which is the dark twin of leadership. And it kind of I'm trying to explore the, the system dynamics of, you know, why leaders aren't doing the things they should be doing. And the reason that you actually go and hire one of these really expensive consultancies is you realize that you're probably reaching a point where you might get sacked yourself. So you go and hire this consultancy knowing that because you've now spent several million on a particular consultancy, if you do lose your job, they will make sure that you get another good, well-paid job where you can hire them again. <laughs> that's, that's deep. So what they're getting by hiring the consultancies who are pretty crap at what they do is job security. And the fact that the consultants have got a vested interest in them having an even bigger job in another company that they work with. Right. I think, I think that's a really good point, actually, because I'm sorry I'm, I'm jumping in and talking, and I know I'm not on the panel, but the, 
one of the things I think one of the things that people talk about is don't scale agile, descale the work. And I think what's happening is that <clears throat> because of technology advances and that sort of thing, there is an opportunity, like you said, for fintech, where you can actually descale the work by setting up a company that's much smaller and doing and going and being a lot more agile. Um, but at some point, yeah, I think that I think that's happening a lot. I, I think the other thing about Agile that we, we kind of don't talk about a lot is we, we, we sell this dream that you can bring Agile and your organization will become Agile. What tends to happen is when people really want to do Agile, they cluster together. So once you get to the point where you actually can do Agile and you're doing it well, more often than not, you will actually go and seek out a group of people who are already working that way. Whereas, you know, in, in, the, in the noughties, in, for the f first 10 years, you had to train colleagues to actually work in the way that you wanted in order to work with them. Now, you're much more likely to be in that network and go and work with people who already work in the way that you want. And as a result, it's much harder for these companies to get access to the people with genuine experience, particularly in the software development space, getting, getting the idea of being able to go into the market and hiring a, a bunch of really experienced XP kind of developers it, it's really hard to do because they will actually much prefer to work with people who value their skills rather than go to a company where their skills are not valued so well. You're nodding there, Tom. Is that mm. your experience? I, yeah. I think, sorry. Um, oh, par pardon me, Tom. Go ahead. No, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things about the noughties, I mean, we, we always used to joke because I worked in trading systems in the city that we always used to joke that actually we introduced agile to try and get some degree of control over what the developers were doing um and and it was it was incredibly exciting and we didn't we didn't do agile properly we didn't do it but we had it goes back to the other question how might we make agile exciting again i mean one of the I was talking to some people to, I was trying, <laughs> sorry, i'm in a really depressing gig at the moment and i was trying to explain to somebody why I was really excited about Agile and I was saying we just, there's this, when it's working well, and it's nothing to do, well it is to do with all the practices, but when it's working well, it is magic, there is this magic that happens when the, somebody wants something and people come together and they make that thing happen and they give them that thing they wanted, and it's amazing and everybody is really excited and happy, and then, I mean, Mike Burrow talks about this really well, it's like when he talks about Lego, it's like here's Lego with all the kids play with Lego and here's Lego with a factory making plastic bricks and whenever we get to, there's a point in all agile when you stop thinking about the kids playing with lego and start thinking about the fucking bricks and all of the joy goes out of it and i, I don't i don't know it's but but yeah we just we just as an industry we we seem maybe it's not just maybe it's a race <laughs> yeah. to a certain scale and we just like squeeze the joy out of everything because it's that's not efficient or something yeah um yeah. sorry rant over <laughs> no, no. so it's all about it's all about the leadership and the yeah. space that they make so i have a question for you uh what what does the ideal world look like right i'm going to offer you something in an ideal world when you sit down and talk to the executives who are buying agile and you realize that as soon as you get out of the seat before your seat is is cold there's going to be another butt in that seat selling the same thing the the executive is going to ask you um, do I, is engagement essential for this, any of this stuff to work? Do my people have to be engaged for all, any of this stuff to work? And you're going to say yes. And they're going to say, what's your plan to engage the people? What's your plan to engage my people in this process? And then you're going to lay it out and you're going to tell them how you're going to do it, right? How are you going to use open patterns to do this stuff? How are you going to bring people in on a volunteer basis and opt-in basis and work with willing teams? Right now, executives don't ask that question. They don't ask the question, do my people have to be engaged for this stuff to work? You wanna know why they don't ask that question? Anybody wanna know why? Anybody yeah. have any idea why you wanna offer a reason why? Why don't executives because they ask don't this care. question? Huh? Because they don't care. No, they care. They, let's I assume think they care. A, right? I think His, a, go ahead. I think there's a generational gap yeah, so, that's being exploited by the agile industrial complex. So until these people age out, it's just going to be a mess. Frederick? Um, probably most of you have heard uh, you never get fired for um, going with IBM, at least when IBM was strong. Um, 
the problem with Agile is that Agile doesn't give a rat's ass about documentation. And when things go south, you can save your job when you have documentation. So I feel that one of the things that scares executives and that most coaches don't understand, but I know Luca, you know, and Danielle, you know, it's when as a coach, you lose your job, you'll find another one in a month. When as an executive, you lose your job, you'll find one next year if you're lucky. Because usually when you're an executive, you've grown in a company. It took time. It was um, social capital that got you there, not competence. Competence was a part, but social capital was key. Yeah. And so yeah. you, you kind of isolated yourself. And people don't want to lose their job just for an idea. Right. Um, because that guarantees they'll have sex with their wife. They'll bring their kids to trips. And they're not going to lose all that just for an idea. Um, okay. So I feel that we need to understand what is difficult for executives. That's but fair. But, to, but, but, but can, I, can I come back to your question, Dan, which is why don't they ask that question? Because yeah. the, the, if, if you don't look because... at what's being sold, if you look at Agile, what we call Agile, right, it's a set of practices, a set of values, and it's fundamentally about having experience. It's about being able to do this stuff. It's about doing and helping others do it. But if you actually look at what's being sold as Agile, it's not Agile. Why? It's frameworks, it's Why? certifications, and it's tooling. Now, if you look at what Agile did, Agile said, yeah, we want to work in this way. And it kind of coincided with the open source movement. And so we want to do, you know, test, you know, TDD. Well, let's build some open source tools to support that. So the tools used to support the way we wanted to work. But now what you find is that these companies are selling tools. They're selling right. training. They're selling because you know what? You can sell the same thing to everyone and people buy it. But the reason they don't want to ask it is because they don't want to get involved in the fact that they're actually going to have to engage with their people and say, you're going to have to learn a new set of practices. You're going to have to learn a new set of values. You're going to have to learn a new way of thinking. But that's hard to do. So what we're going to do is we're just going to buy tools. We're going yeah. to buy certification. That's fair. We're going to buy That's a fair. process yeah. and we'll upload it on the website. And you know what? Yeah. I am now the Agile Transformation Lead and I can say I've done right. all of this. I've bought Why? the bestest, most expensive consultancy and I have bought tools. I have bought processes. I've bought certification and I'm not engaging with that difficult thing. And I have to say a big thank you to you, Dan, because I was working with a client and we hadn't got engagement. And I read this mad little book called the open source kind open space of agility handbook oh well, yeah 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 it's a mad little book and it just worked and it was literally magic but you know the problem i have is getting people to even allow me to give people the choice to attend and opt into those things but if you yeah. can get your your magic on in the organization it's great but I'm going to tell you it's how. It's hard stuff. You can't yeah. change people who, you know, yeah. you've got to remember a lot of these employees in these companies, they're going to retire in 30 years time. So why would they learn something new now when they're only going to retire in 30 years? Chris, well, I have a question for you. Uh, one, second, um, one second, I do the facilitator now. Let's move to the next question uh, from uh, uh, Slido. So remember to post your question there. Sorry, Zach. Uh, if you have a question, post it on, uh, on uh, Slido and vote it. So the next one is, uh, uh, I guess you see that, uh, how, to, uh, how might we excite people about Agile? Uh, yeah, well, I, I want to answer that. I think the answer is, if executives know that willing people power all the improvement and that unwilling people actually cause the impediments and the ultimate fail. If they learn that the, the people have to be engaged for any of the stuff to work, then it wouldn't be normal to force agile on people because executives would know. Okay. So the reason why executives don't know is because the industry hasn't taught them anything about this because it's not in the industry's interest to teach how willing people power all the improvement. That would get you transformations at the expense of transactions. If I knew as an executive that people need to be engaged, I'd be engaging them and I wouldn't be needing external consultants to help me do that, okay? 
So this is what's actually going on in the world today. The reason why we have all these problems that, that Chris and uh, Luca and, and everyone has mentioned is because executives have not been taught and they're ignorant and they've been kept ignorant and dumb by the industry. The industry has nothing to say about this because it would, it would, it would be a hit on revenue to stop the parade of imposition, okay? Because there's millions of dollars at stake. So if you want to make people excited, put them on a decision to, to join or not. May, let people decide. Because you know what? Decisions turn out to be very engaging. Okay? Decisions turn out to be engaging. You generate a decision point through an invitation. Invitation generates decisions. Decisions generate engagement. And engagement generates results. So you got to put people on decisions if you want to engage them. Enforced Agile doesn't do that. It just tells people, do this or else. Can, you know, can I just of, paraphrase and see if I understood that? What you're saying is we should have real options rather than commitments. That's right. Yeah. In your language, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And oh, by the way, don't commit early unless you know why. A lot of people are going to hang out and watch what's going on. So you put out a pilot. You generate positive results, you generate some buzz, more people want to get on. After a while, they realize the train's leaving the station. Everyone gets on at the last responsible moment because they want to join in the party and in the fun. And this is the reality of how it actually works. This is what I'm, I've been doing for the past five or six years in the companies I work in. And it works awesome, right? The industry has not taught executives what they need to know about engaging people because it's not in the economic interest of the institutions and the, and the big consulting firms to teach that. Also, not the, you know, you're exactly. raising something super important here because it's true that all these purchases from large consulting firms or certifications from learning and development departments, they are actually non-decisions. They are the default mode. They, are, right. they purchase this the way they would purchase something else the way they were purchasing another methodology last year and they will buy another one next year. The question that maybe we can explore together is how can we, how can we invite them to, to explore that letting go and that making a decision in a place that is not, um, in a way that doesn't look like the last decision they will ever make? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Real good question. In a, in a sense, uh, I think in a sense, this is happening. So going back to the question, that's the initial thesis of Dan, that at the root of the agile industrial complex, there is this point of a decision. And if you give people the decision, you get the excitement. And many organizations start to notice it's, I mean, those scaled framework and those transformation bullshit is out there from 10, 15 years, long right. enough for people to see action and consequences and repeat it repeatedly enough to even connect the action and the consequences. And so there are leaders that start to see that their workers want to leave. They hate this imposition. And they right. start to see that their managers hate it. And in the end, they hate it too. They are bored with this stuff. And they, some of them start to understand that there's a different way of doing that. So it's slowly coming. Of course, we have to do much more. But I think someone is starting to connect the dots. And, and this is where the... the so... I've, I've I'm talk, I mentioned this blog post series I've done, which is around what I call failureship. And what that's really about is trying to start a conversation with executives about how they have to change their behavior. Because one of the things you're saying, Dan, is you, you, you way you do an agile transformation is you start with one team. You get one team excited. They get rewarded for, for doing well. They get recognized for doing well. And then you got two teams and then you got four and you grow. And then, then you have a value stream and, and you grow it. Yeah. Um, but what tends to happen is that, you know, the business is getting IT to do stuff and they need to get stuff done. So people cut corners still. So, you know, they do the 16 hour a day death march, seven days a week to get things delivered. 
and the leadership reward them for it. So they show that actually, you know what, I'm going to reward you for running a death march. And these people over here are having a good time actually delivering stuff in an agile way, in a way that they don't have to kill themselves doing it. We're not going to give you a reward because the reward is the work itself. And everyone right. starts to get the message. What's important is the death march, getting stuff done. And so this is where the, the failureship blogs is really about trying to start that conversation. It's, it's meant to be like the new manifest, a, a manifesto where I am not telling execs how to do stuff. But what I want to do is get the successful execs who've done this to start talking to each other, to start identifying the patterns of behaviors that they have that they can then share with other people. But you see, if you actually go and look at most of the executive agile coaching that goes on, it's all about flow, lean, right. Kinevin, and these agile things. No, it, it shouldn't be. The executive coaching is about helping them understand systems and how their behavior has a significant effect on the system and that it's not going to change immediately when they ask for something, but they're going to have to work hard at doing it and they're going to have to reward it for doing the right thing and kind of give it less energy when it does the wrong thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, sorry, let, we have plenty of questions. And uh, okay. Stephen, if you want to add something, ask a question and you will invite it when your question is uh, uh, Stefan Smith. I saw, I saw your hand raised. Let's move to the next question that uh, uh, there has been a competition between that one and the previous. So to what extent do you think that the inability of Agile to offer absolute predictability make fake Agile more attractive? Is this is, this is insanity. This is insanity itself. If you can't use Agile to, to increase predictability, you're not doing it right. You're just not. I mean, it's all about increasing predictability and reducing what you might call the liminal space uh, so that we can make decisions around that. That The whole purpose of doing Agile is to increase the value delivery at, at higher quality that, and, and to be able to predict the quality and predict the value delivery within, within acceptable, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? tolerances within within acceptable tolerances you can't predict anything but i mean you can predict statistically where something might land with a high degree of accuracy and this is the name of the game so i'm gonna i'm gonna just say something now the biggest problem in the world today is that people are suckers for a coherent story that could be bullshit Okay, we're listening for a story that will confirm our model of reality. And when we hear it, we're drawn there. So this is what screws up politics. This is what screws up the world in general. This is what screws up agility. Most people are not willing to sit with any degree of uncertainty. So when we come in and we go, hey, we're going to do a little and learn, learn a little. And then within acceptable tolerances, we're going to be able to predict things. They go, uh, that doesn't resonate with me. I want an ABC story that's coherent. Anybody ever see that thing in the, in the Matrix where the guy's cipher is eating the steak? And he goes, I know this steak is bullshit, but it tastes so good. That's what I'm talking about. People are suckers for a coherent story, and they'll believe any line of bullshit over sitting with ambiguity, liminality, um, uncertainty. This is the biggest problem in the world today, in my opinion. Then on a positive note, talking about uh, uh, helping executives, it is also true that there is another degree of control and predictability that comes accept, accepting a degree of uh, lack of control and, 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 pred and predictability. So you, you leave that on one side, and you get that back on the other side when you accept to make that jump, that jump of faith, because there is a paradigm shift and there is a jump of faith. I, I had to make that jump when I learned the Agile. I was a software engineer studying theory and the mathematical the theorems at the university. And I... 
So, so can 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 I can I I want to come back to this question. To what extent do you think the inability of agile to offer absolute predictability when well, none exists? Well, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm I'm not worried. Whoever whoever asked it asked it. But the key thing is what agile does is it is transparent. It embraces reality and it accepts right. that you cannot have absolute predictability but let's be clear you can have more predictability using agile than you can with a project manager pulling numbers out of his ass and making shit up in fact but that's the only it's reason it's a shiny number that looks good and it's a coherent story whereas you know but you know what if you actually sit down with the, oh, this is what my job is is to sit with the business and help them understand you know what we're going to build a little thing and from that we're going to be then be able to better predict because we're going to have more data and okay when at the start of the project we're not going to be able to predict so well but at the end of the project we're going to be able to predict better the other guys just making shit up and they're like you know what well, when, when you explain and help them understand that's cool but there is no absolute predictability R agile is about embracing reality right. and getting rid of this shitty lie that dan's referring to but it sells, so this is what gets sold every day of the week because it's what they're buying. I'd have to be an idiot to sell them what they're not buying. I want to sell them what they're buying. So I'm going to sell them predictability, a coherent story that's BS. Yeah. Okay, let's move up the next one. Horatio has been uh, uh, pushed down two times. So, so poor Horatio, this time I feel he, he need to get his uh, question answered. Uh, we waited when he was at the top. So are the various movements more about jargon and attention seeking ideas? And uh, I will ask Horatio to ask, uh, I will ask him which movement is he referring to? Are you still with us? Maybe he went away after his question has been pumped uh, down a few times. Horatio, are you around? I take it as a no. So when he come back, we can go back to the question. But five other people had asked that, wanted that question asked as well. So let's let's go for it. So sure. what I'm going to say is there are two there are two parts to the community. There's what I call the community of needs, which is where you're working with people to solve their problems and understand their needs, and as a result, you come up with a solution. And then there's the community of solutions where people are selling you a solution, normally with certificate associated. I say that community of needs, it is still thriving. You just have to know where to look for it and it's still good. The, the problem is that it's drowned out now. So you can't, you can't go to a conference now and meet 200 people passionate about say, say solving the same problem as you because the expectation is that the guy on the stage is gonna do all the talking and the people in the audience are gonna do all the listening which is community solutions versus the conferences that I always valued where the, where it's you acknowledge the fact that that person who's never been to an agile conference before is probably the one most worth living to because he's experienced a context that none of the others have. So it's listening versus talking. And there's two parts of the community. One of them is in rude health, making lots of money. The other one is pretty much dead, but if you know where it is, you can find it. It, it tends to be less public events now. Is that an answer that's allowed, Luca? Or have I just broken the code of conduct again? <laughs> no, you haven't. So uh, what, what I want, um, no, I don't want to add anything on this actually. I was thinking ahead. Dan, do you want to add anything to this question or should we move to the next one? Um... I think that in general to this question, I say this, I noticed that people don't get any smarter when they join a group. Actually, people get dumber when we get dumber, when we end up in a group. So fads and, and movements and stuff, these things are group phenomena. Okay. And in general, group phenomena is not the smartest phenomena on the planet. Have you ever seen the picture of everyone giving the Nazi salute and there's one guy with his arms crossed and he's not doing it? Has anyone ever seen that picture? There's this one guy among 500 people who's not, not doing the thing. It, 
you have to have tremendous force of will uh, to, to buck the crowd. So I think a lot of times the crowd just gets swept along in, in, in these manias. That's what I think happens. So I kind of agree with the, with the questioner, I guess. Thank yeah. you for a different perspective. And so next questions is uh, this one. If not agile, what is the alternative? What will be the new agile? <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Me? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you, 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 you answered for because I'm just sitting here going, I just think we need people talking about what they're doing rather than selling shit, um, which is kind of what agile used to be. Um, yeah. What's Zach got to say? Zach's got his hand up. Go. Yeah. Um, I think you've got to let people do the stuff that isn't measurable, which are the top five soft skills that are in demand, which is creativity, persuasion, adaptability, collaboration, and personal time management. On the other side of it, you've got the hard skills, which we all do with our technology coaching, which at the moment is cloud, ML, rational, people management, and new UX. <clears throat> I think that um, if we went back 100 years in time, we'd see so many similarities to today's situation when the Bauhaus came out and created a design school that was a thwart towards war, which we don't really have a, a world war. They had Spanish flu, which was bigger than COVID. And they had the threat of mass production coming through, where we have the threat of automation, which scares a heck of a lot of managers because I automate them out of jobs. Um, so it's taking that ability to bring it in. And the other thing that I think that we can do to help people engage is to take the concept of a user story, but turn it internally into the business, something that I call a lean scene. So it's actions that you can take to change the process. And you can change those processes in the small and use a couple of um, value chains and organizing frameworks to be able to explain the ROI at operational and strategic level. And with that, you engage the managers who are sitting off because you can go and get top cover from the guys at the top and they then go and tell the team that you've got six months to get the job done. You do it in one, and then you bring the story back to the team that makes the change, and you share the successes with the teams that are similar. You don't try to do a top-down imposition. Uh, and with that, what you find is that um, coming out of the army mentality, um, initially they'll try to break people to get them to work as teams. But the people that survive that and then realize that the system they're working in gives them a sense of personal value, they continue to increase the value for the company. So it stops people jumping off to other jobs that look a bit better, but eventually turn out to be just what they left. Sorry, I will thank shut you. up now. No, thank you, Zach. You also uh, started the topic that is connected with the question that will come soon. Uh, Tom, then Tom, you you have something to I, say? Yeah, I was thinking. I think so, and I think this will probably be about as successful as XP was. So I think there is a lot of the one of the biggest problems we've got is that senior executives in a lot of organisations. It's not just that. It's not just IT. Senior executives in a lot of organisations aren't really interested in transforming themselves. They're interested in transforming the organisation they own or manage to be transformed to be magically better than it currently is and there's a huge amount of what I call alchemical thinking and agile theatre there's a huge amount of if we do all these things and we, and we make these correct steps and we do these correct incantations we will get the outcomes we want we don't know quite what's happening so we just have to follow the form um, so there's a there's so I think you're doing one Dan with your open space agility but there's this there's a bunch of I can't think of um, 
well, I call it engagement models because that's what Mike Burroughs calls agenda shift. Um, there's a bunch of engagement models and transformation models that are coming through, which actually engage much more with the whole thing about the whole the whole engagement rather than just the surface level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, and I but, think those are the things that will follow along with that they'll be the new agile, if you like. But sadly, I suspect that they will be co-opted and undermined and one will come out and become the one that everybody wants to do and probably it'll be um dean will develop it um and then we'll all be doing that and we'll all be decrying that in 15 years because that's gone through the same curve that we've just seen agile go through god i'm in a battle can, 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 anyway, can i come out and answer this <laughs> properly now so <clears throat> My view. So for me, that the real value of Agile was a learning community where Pete, you know, Agile was the first time where a developer would sit with a tester and discuss how they made the process better. And they would bring in the project managers and the business analysts and all of these people. And the real value of Agile was rather than each discipline trying to optimize themselves, it was about um, the whole people coming together to try and optimize the whole. And that's what's great when you've gone really good at projects and working with really good people is they're all moving their position away from what's perfect for them to what's better for the team. And they kind of identify the team. I think one of the problems that we've always had with Agile, that if we're going to have a new Agile, is we're going to carry on doing a lot of the stuff we're doing, but we're going to lose some of the bigotry and the rollism that we had where basically Agile was a way for the for the developers to re uh, to re uh, redefine the power structure within the technology departments, and it was about moving the developer to the center of things. They brought the tester with them, but a lot of that was about basically poking the project manager and the business analyst in the eye. And a lot of these companies where they're really having a lot of pain. Are the companies where they've got a they've got a need for project for business analysts perhaps more than product owners and what we didn't do was bring the bas in so that we could listen to the business analysts and find out in the same way that we went and studied what ward cunningham and ron jeffries and ken beck were doing we didn't do the same with the business analysts and with the project managers we kind of just insulted them and then what we did is we listened to developers who'd never been a business analyst and didn't really understand what they were doing. And we listened to them and forced their practices onto the business analysis community. And as a result, they pushed back. So I think what is the new agile? The new agile is going to be one where we get rid of those chips on our shoulders and we truly engage with everybody involved in this party and not only truly engage with them, but we study the good people who are doing these things as they're actually doing it rather than simply listen to someone because they're a famous developer or they're a famous tester or they're a famous consultant. Let's go and study the people who are good at these things that we haven't really looked at yet, where what we've tried to do is say we don't need them because they're often the organizations that are struggling the most with this stuff. Yeah. And uh, uh, Chris, well, just to acknowledge that uh, Dan uh, left us, he is in another time zone, so he had to drop. We lost uh, Dan, and uh, I was coming to to read the question that is connected with what you were already saying. So, uh, how can we do better? Uh, the 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 question say we know all the fake but how can we do better and i think this is what you were discussing chris we already started to discuss that how can we do better we, we've got to rather than just assume that because we're a good developer we're going to be a perfect business analyst you that, that's a relationship and it's kind of like the developers on one end and the business analyst is on the other side, rather than saying, oh, the developer is going to tell the business analyst how to do their job better. We should be engaging with the good business analyst. We should be engaging with the good project managers. Because we've not done that, we've not brought them into the fold. We've not really gained the, the critical mass and credibility in some of these disciplines because we've considered them not to be agile disciplines. But the reality is they're there. Yeah, and they're going to be there for a long while. 
So let's pick the good ones and get the good practices from them and promote the good practices rather than just trash the entire kind of discipline. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things. Well, when I when I manage to work in organization uh, that are trying to adopt agile as outside technology, and I ask, uh, what problem do you want to solve? I don't start talking about agile. I start telling them that I use agile as a tool. I'm more interested mm -hmm. in something useful for them. And actually, to your point, uh, collaboration. They say we do not collaborate across team, across vice president, across department. Help us to collaborate better. And mm -hmm. uh, this kind of resonates with what you were saying, Chris. But answering also to the question of, from another angle, I think another way that we can help, uh, I'm thinking about our community and uh, my thinking is to amplify that signs of hope. Those practitioners that say, this is not enough for me. This community of solution is not enough. This framework is, is became too small to me and being there and show them where they can connect with other like-minded people or uh, to help amplify those uh, CEO and decision maker that start to share information and say, you know, we learned our lesson. We thought it was a good idea after 10 years. We know it is not. And, and I think I, I love this idea of a new community, but I'd, I'd, I'd just ask that, you know, we should have a community where people are only allowed to do the keynote speech if they're talking about stuff they've done. Yeah. And if they're prepared to bring, if we've got a consultant doing the, the talk, they're prepared to bring one of the customers with them to talk about their story as well. I hear too many stories where people all say, and then I got my magic hat. And in two days, the whole company was fixed. It's like, well, I know personally, my experience is when you're dealing with senior people, you for nine months at least nine months you basically have to fix every problem that they've got and after nine months of fixing the problems that they think they have they may then just say to you okay you i now know that you can fix problems for me which problem do you think i should fix yeah because no one's ever going to just walk in you know the idea that a consultant can walk into any of these big companies because that that's what we're talking about in the agile industrial complex companies of more than say 500 a thousand people and on day one just tell them something that they're not that they're going to be able to implement and fix the company's bollocks you need to spend months if not years building credibility with the senior people to actually make significant changes to an organization that's going to help people so this idea that we allow these people who've never done this stuff to stand on stage and give keynotes at our conferences and who say in two days i went in and i completely changed the company it's like bollocks if anything the company already wanted to do it and they used them to make the announcement and that they could blame them if it went wrong that sounds yeah. cancel culture chris are you suggesting cancel culture <laughs> Well, no, I'm just saying that if we're going to create a, com a real agile community, we should say the people giving the keynotes should only be talking about stuff they've done. Yeah, the, the, the manifesto is really clear. We're going to improve things by doing stuff, not by making shit up while we're sitting on the toilet and selling it as safe, even though we know it's not safe. Uh, Frederick, before we jump to the next question and... Uh... I also ask Corrado for the timekeeping. Go on, Frederick. Right. Um, well, Chris, I wanted to thank you because at the beginning of my career, I was an SAP consultant and I moved away from this because I couldn't understand how a 23 year old could impose best practices, so called SAP best practices, to people who worked for 35 years on, on their domain. And I realized that a lot of agile. As agile coaches, we're, we're often asked to do exactly the same thing. And because context is key, of course, we're going to make it wrong. So I, I agree that serving people is key. One question that I would have for you is, I know for, for a fact that Luca is doing this very often. But the thing is, there is, a, there is a, an inherent risk in that. Um, because 
it it does take time and whether we choose to do that or we choose to have um experiences that are going to shake them a bit um not telling them but having them leave the experiences at some point there's going to be this dip and a lot of people are not comfortable with the dip or with the weight before things move so i was wondering how we can address this um because people if people have not changed their mindset yet and most will not have change their mindset, they will expect quick results. So how do we, how do we address this? How do we stay grounded in, uh, in the core principles and at the same time um, help them bridge that gap? So, so my only experience, the, 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 what, what I found, this is where really good leaders, I, I have been so blessed to work with so many brilliant leaders in the business, in IT and so on. And they're the ones who manage the dip. Yeah, they're the ones who carry the group through the difficult times. I remember there was a time when, we, when I was at Skype and uh, the, the, the exec in charge of product was just brilliant because we'd explain to him the idea that the estimates that we've got, the actuals on the estimates over the, uh, if you plot actuals versus estimates, it follows a log normal distribution. And that actually most of the time, the most popular thing is that your estimates are double, your actuals are double your estimate, but 10% of the time, it's 10%. Uh, it, it, 10% of the time, it's four times your estimate, whatever it is. And we're doing this big estimation process that we're using for 2000 developers. There's like 50 product owners in the room coming up with the backlog for the next quarter. And one of the, one of the, the product owners was worried and he said, I'm really worried about the accuracy of my estimates and the the exec just went chris tell him about the log normal curve tell him about the log normal curve and i said yeah i want to remind you that when you say that the estimate is two in actual fact most of the time it's going to be four and in 10 percent of the cases it's going to be eight so when you say that you want to do an estimate of 2.2 are you aware that you're saying that in reality it's going to be 4.4 or it's going to be 8.8 .8. and it was the executive who carried it through you know that dip where people got really concerned about the act the precision of the estimates rather than the accuracy um because there's nothing i can say that's really going to alleviate their concern and, and that's where we need the leadership and i say i've been very lucky to work with some brilliant leaders over the years loads of them that's what they understand their job to be to carry people across the dip so that they carry on and force through the change rather than retreat and go and run a, a, a say instead of doing agile it's too difficult we're going to do it as a death march instead because that's obviously going to be successful yeah, yeah. I, i've seen some of those leaders sometimes uh, they have to struggle with the organization politics and uh, uh, they need to uh, yeah, find their energy or find their, uh, their uh, chips to play in order to allow others to do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I see some of those uh, when they could do that and that was great. That was yeah, great. And, and, the, and this comes back to my previous point. Yeah, those leaders have someone lying to them every day. Every person who goes in to sell them something is generally lying to them. And that's why I said about the nine months, because they need to know that when you say you can do something, you can do it because they're playing big boy politics. You know, they know that if they trip, they're going to get tripped up and someone else is going to push them over. And so that's why you do the nine months to the point where they, they can trust you and that know that if you say to them, yes, I can do it, you can do it. And when you say to them that you can't, no, I can't do it but they need to be able to trust you when they're taking those big steps. Um, but, you know, they're, they're being, you know, they've, as Dan was saying, they've got 10 people a day coming in, sitting in that seat, telling them the same thing. Um, you know, um, it's the leaders who are going to carry across, but you have to build the trust. It takes time. Yeah. And, but that's not part of the narrative, obviously, because the thing about the industrial complex is, hire me and within two weeks we will have the first sprint up and running and we'll have delivered training to 2000 people they'll all have certificates and your company will be wonderful in a month 
just pay me a million dollars. Yeah. Zach, uh, before we try to answer some other question, and then again, Corrado, are, how are we with the timing? Corrado, are you there? Uh, how are we with the timing? Uh, I'm there, but I was expecting Zach. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, can can, I, can I, um, I say we've got another 11 minutes, if that's all right? Otherwise, I'm going to be in trouble. The CEO's downstairs. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, I think the paradigm is changing away from architecture, more towards movies and games in the way that software is developed. If you ever watch somebody um, making music on a computer, you'll find that it's very similar to the way that we develop software. A lot of it is samples. Every developer I know takes 90% of their code off the internet as a sample. With that, there's a, you can think of development as being the tech, the, like the soundtrack to a movie. So the things that business analysts should be doing is learning the new UX so as they can go and work with the strategists and get the screenplays made up. Because when we're developing software, it is mainly a screenplay. Underneath it is the soundtrack that's going to shift the workflow. In terms of getting through the dip, the way that I do it is that I know from this movie paradigm, there are eight different arcs through any piece of work, whether you want to call it a project, a service build, a product build, I don't care. I know that there's going to be periods of highs and lows, and you use that at the beginning to do scenario planning, so that when you see the inflection coming in, when you understand that the team's not firing on all cylinders or if one individual is playing around, you can move in and fix it as a coach. So it's just, I see a, a, a move in that direction and there's a set of tools and techniques that um, I'm more than happy to share, but this is your, um, your presentation. So if you want to connect afterwards, I will share. Thank yes, you. please. Yeah, but by the way, Zach will be one of the speakers in the next meetups. So you are invited to join uh, Zach's talk if you want. Cool. Uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, Stefan, are you still around? Mm -hmm. uh, I let a lot of people raise the hand and talk, and you're the only one that I blocked. Uh, I don't know if now is the right time to, to call you back and make your comment, but uh, I screw up before, so apologies for that. No worries, Luca. It's just a really minor point. Um, it's possibly still valid. Um, it's just that um, it sounds like um, the execs aren't safe, and I just wonder how we expect an agile transformation to be safe if the leadership aren't safe. And, and so that is... The, what the, the conversation I'm trying to start with is kind of leadership blogs, which is I want the execs who've done this to start coming together because I, I, I don't want the, the, the problem is that the way we tend to treat execs is we treat them like gods. So the fact that they're prepared to come and talk to us at all, they just go and stand on the stage and they talk at people about what they've done. And I, I'd, I'd rather that they were engaged in a conversation in the same way that we were engaged in that conversation in the noughties where the tester and the developer and the BAs and the project are all talking together. We need to do the same with the execs because it, it's rarely a single exec that does this, but rather there's a team of them who come together. And, and that's why I was trying to show in that, um, the, uh, the, the, the kind of the crossing the chasm thing. A, a lot of these companies, it, it, the, the, what we're often looking for is, we, it, it's the kind of, as Zach was saying, is we're looking for the hero narrative. We're looking for the individual who made the difference. And it's not the individual, it's an ensemble cast who do this. And I think having conversations about the fact that it's not the hero that does this, there's an ensemble cast. There's, there's the CFO needs to be bought in. I mean, I was working at Lloyd's and it was brilliant. We, at Lloyd's, what we did, and Luca, you're at Lloyd's, I don't think they did the training by then, but we did this one day training course for business, business senior management, IT, IT management, everyone. We, we trained 2000 people through this course. And we'd started by just asking the question, why are we doing Agile? And it was just brilliant because one day we stood there and we'd ask this question, why are we doing Agile? And one of the questions, and, and we have a Q&A afterwards and someone put their hands up and goes, you know what? I don't know why we're bothering you even talking about this because there's no way that finance will ever let us do this. And one guy at the back of the room put his hand up and he goes, I think they will. And he goes, 
well, why do you think that? He goes, well, I'm the group CFO and it's my job to make sure that finance support this. And it was so powerful that moment, but that, that's the thing. It's not, the, the, the problem with the narrative from the community solutions is there is a hero and it's normally a person selling themselves as the hero who's got the magic hex spell and the, the, the spider webs and stuff. It's not, it's an ensemble class. It's the whole group who go, and I want the managers, the leaders to start talking about sh- coming together, discussing and sharing their stories so that we can start to distill what are the executive patterns that we need? What are the leadership patterns that we need? What are the management patterns that we need? Because we do need leadership, yes, but that's for change. We also need management, which is for stability. Yeah, and we, we just need to get those people talking together. So that's one of those groups that if we do a new agile, it would be to get those people to talk and to get those people to talk. Because the really good ones are talking to the developers. They're talking to the testers. Yeah, they're breaking down those barriers. Um, so rambling answer that went over a minute, but I think I stole Dan's minute. Yeah, so. just just jumping in. Um, there are five minutes before that uh, Chris has to go. So yeah, I think it could be a good idea for Chris to the brief a little bit after this uh, challenging situation. So maybe if we can wrap up. Yeah, Good. Be- be- before we do, before we wrap up, I just want to kind of say something about leadership here, which is uh, I joined a company at the start of the year, uh, well, at the start of February. So I've only been there for a month and a half. And uh, I-, I started working with these colleagues. And one of the, uh, and, and the companies, most of, uh, most of the le- leadership is actually, a lot of the leadership is in the Ukraine. And what has been incredible is I was talking to one of my colleagues who was helping me on board uh, consultants onto a client. And every day I'd say to him, oh, you know, what about this Russia thing? And he'd be like, oh, you know, don't, don't, um, uh, don't worry about it. It's been going on for eight years. It's just ignore it, ignore it. And then one morning, couple, Thursday, a couple of weeks ago, I contacted him on Skype and I said, are you free to chat about onboarding? And he said, no not free running west russia invaded and what has been incredible over this last couple of weeks is uh, my boss was living in kiev he is now continuing to support and run his job out of a hotel room on western ukraine the guy who was uh doing the, uh, the helping me with the onboarding has taken a sabbatical to support the United Nations uh, Humanitarian Relief Fund for three months. And a new guy joined two weeks ago, and he has kind of stepped in and backfilled both of those people to help them. And it's just the incredible agility that I've experienced through this thing. And I just want to call him out because Pavel is actually on the call now. Um, and, and he's just come in and backfilled and without really being told, he's just taken all the pressure off of these people, <laughs> Hello, off of Grace. these other two managers so that, you know, they can kind of do what they need to do. But, I, but to me, that's leadership. That's kind of management, leadership, whatever we call it. And just, just a round of applause for Powell, please. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, well, that's true. We're trying to be agile. I was like a silent listener to the whole meetup uh, because I'm trying to work um, during the call as well. So, uh, but <laughs> thank you for the kind words. Uh, yeah, we all are trying to support our colleagues from Ukraine, and uh, yeah, that that's really agile. We we are adapting to <laughs> to the. To, 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 to the situation. So, yep. And so what the organization had done, the consultancy had done as well, uh, Pavel can mention the name if he wants, but I'm, I won't, uh, I don't know. But within a few days, the entire organization's management structure had made sure that a manager was in touch with every single employee working in the Ukraine, which was 4,000 people. And there, the organization's helping to kind of support them in however they want. And the same with the 4,000 employees in Russia. So uh, just want to, you know, uh, 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 big companies can do that. This is a company with 200,000 employees. So thank you, Paul. Anyway, sorry, I'm going to pass back now. Sorry, that was my last comment about leadership. Agile. No, I'll just be quiet. Uh, 
the only thing that I want to say to, to close is that uh, there are still many questions, but uh, Chris, Dan, and myself in different areas, we have created a lot of material behind uh, this. Uh, so if you have further questions, don't, uh, don't be shy to reach out to Chris, Dan, and uh, even uh, me. Uh, apart from that, uh, thank you very much for uh, all your questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, I think uh, that's all. Yeah, let me stop the recording.